This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. Last time we were together, I was reminding you that you've got to be careful about the context of the term kingdom and who you listen to on that. Take your Bibles and read those passages, see how they're interrelated. And uh, the conclusion that we've come to, of course, is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are referring to, to the same thing in the parables and in the gospels. In Jesus' teaching, he's referring to the, the spiritual realm or reign of God in the church. It's not a physical place. It's not a kingdom that's yet to be established at Christ's return. It's the, it's the church. And I, I said that there were four interrelated concepts that help us to see that. And we started with the reign of God. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is any place where God reigns in people's hearts, where they have submitted to him as uh, the creator of the universe and, and want to follow whatever it is in a spiritual nature that God dictates for man. And we took a look at uh, uh, prophecy, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 and following, where Daniel uh, clearly points to a coming kingdom that will have influence throughout the world. We looked at the, the statement made by John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 that the, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The one that was referred to by the prophet Isaiah uh, and John the Baptist was the voice crying in the wilderness. We saw that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 7 that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And uh, indeed, in the person of Jesus Christ, this reign of God is expressly manifest in our world today. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. What Paul has reference to then is the, the spiritual nature of the kingdom. And that's the second interrelated idea that we need to understand when we use the term kingdom. Number one, it's, it's the realm of God. Number two, it is spiritual in nature. It is not physical. Here is the most, the single most difficult concept for a lot of people to be able to grasp because of the error that's been taught on this subject. Most of our viewers who are not familiar with New Testament Christianity believe in some form of a physical kingdom that's going to come at, after Jesus comes back to earth. And that is clearly not taught anywhere in Scripture. It is taught in the Schofield Bible. It is taught by John Darby. It is taught in many denominational groups. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, uh, an error that has existed throughout the centuries. Listen to Jesus, John 18, verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. There you have the ultimate word on the nature of the kingdom. It's not a physical kingdom. It's not of this realm. Jesus is referring to the spiritual nature of the kingdom. This spiritual kingdom will be manifest among men in spiritual ways. Look at Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You see, we're talking about a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom. And this kingdom, this spiritual kingdom, this realm of God... God's rule is existent in our world today. 
in the church. The church is made up of souls who have submitted to God, whose hearts recognize God as sovereign in their lives. <clears throat> and the church can properly then be referred to as a kingdom. Now, we know that that's the case, again, not because we have come to that conclusion on our own, but we have followed very carefully and examined what Jesus said on this subject. And let me take you to, to the ultimate proof of that in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. Read these verses with me. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. There's all kinds of things that we could say about these two verses. Uh, as you know, there are all kinds of misconceptions involved in these verses. Peter is not the rock on which the church was established. It's the confession that Peter makes previous to these verses that is the rock that the church is founded upon. But the point that we want to look at in this particular context is this. Jesus promises to build his church, and he promises to give Peter the keys to the kingdom. In other words, the way that you enter to that kingdom. So if he promises to build the church and to give him the keys to the kingdom, we may understand properly that he's talking about the same entity, the church in the kingdom. You would not build one and give him the keys to another. The church in the kingdom are one in God's mind, and we properly understand it that way when we apply these verses to what we've learned in the parables. We also see that to be true in the writing of the apostles. Colossians 1 and verse 13 and 14 illustrates that. For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Paul speaking in the present tense with regard to the kingdom and its existence in the world in the first century, out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his Son. In that kingdom is the place where we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins. It's not a kingdom that's coming at some time future. It existed in Paul's day. We see the same message taught as he writes to the church at Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 12, or 2 and verse 12. So that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So when we say that the kingdom is a reference to the church today, that's what the New Testament tells us. It's not something future to our day. Now, some would object to this saying, well, then does that mean uh, that everything that is a reference to the kingdom in the New Testament is a reference to the kingdom as it exists now? And, and the thing that we need to be reminded of is this. The kingdom has both a present reality and a future to it. I want to talk about that a little bit and look at a couple of verses that help to illustrate that when we come back in just a minute. The kingdom that Jesus talks about in the parables has both a present reality and a future reality. Uh, the future is spoken of in Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. Take a look at that verse. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by, of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 this, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Uh, when he wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, he said this, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom to, be, to, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, these verses help to illustrate that there is a, 
uh, a reality of the kingdom in the future that is yet to be realized. And part of the, the, the uh, confusion that commentators have added to this discussion is they've, they've said, see, look at these verses. These verses could not be possible today, therefore the kingdom doesn't exist today. Let me look, have you look at 2 Peter 1, verse 10. Therefore, bre <clears throat> brethren, be all the more diligent to, be, to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will, ab will be abundantly supplied to you. And Peter describes the coming of that future state in 2 Peter 3, verse 10 and following. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the Heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And, and so, you see, there is this present aspect and future aspect that relates to the term kingdom. All that exists in the spiritual realm now and all those who exist in that spiritual realm now in the church will be transferred into the eternal realm. And the book of Revelation made this very, very clear as we studied it together. God has established his kingdom on earth in the church. It will endure difficulties and trials and tribulations through the century and through man's existence on earth, but God finds it to be precious and it will always be precious in his sight, and he will take that entity into eternity with him. And so remember these four interrelated concepts. The kingdom has reference to the reign of God, God's rule in the hearts of men. It is a kingdom that is spiritual in nature. It is a kingdom that is manifested in the church today. It is a kingdom that has both a present state and a future state. The present state is wherever the sovereignty of God is recognized among people in their obedience to him today. It is a spiritual kingdom in which God rules in the hearts of men today. Its outward expression is seen in the Lord's church today. That church was established in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. It's a future kingdom when, when the kingdom will culminate in God's presence when, as 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24 says, God delivers or Christ delivers the kingdom over to God. And then the righteous will shine forth like the sun, Matthew 13 and verse 43 says. Then the new kingdom will exist in the new heavens and the new earth, 2 Peter 3 and verse 13. It will be experienced only by those in the church who submit to God's rule in their life. And that's the way, that's the way that Jesus uses that term in the parables. And that's why we wanted to spend that, that much time just defining that term. That helps us then to see how those parables are to be applied in our understanding of the church today. And we'll look at another parable when we come back in just a minute. We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.